founder of the first pirate party and author of Swarm Wise, Rick Falkling. Thank you all. It's fantastic to be back in Acapulco at Anarchapulco, one of the most brilliant crowds I ever had the pleasure of addressing and, and discussing with. There's an important difference. So today's going to be a little bit of a history lesson. We can learn a lot by looking at what did people do before us, what mistakes did they make, what successes did they have. And so the title of my talk is Media Militarization Through 600 Years. Let's see, can we have any slides up, please? OK, am I going without slides? There we go. And let's see if we can go full screen as well. There, all right. So, so they're coming up. Awesome. And you can reach me at Falkvinge on Twitter, just like that. If I, whenever I say something really bright, whenever I say something really dumb, <laughs> please tweet about it because I love seeing my name on Twitter, regardless of whether it's dumb or not. <laughs> so. We already have a brief, had a brief introduction here, but just for fun, let's see here. How many have heard of the Swedish Pirate Party before? Let's see a show of hands. OK, yeah, that, I'd say that's most here. That's about 2 thirds. Funny enough, that's so consistent, no matter where I present, that I'm actually putting that in the slides here. And so just for kicks. I know we're anarchists, we don't really believe in the state, and the Pirate Party was a hack of the, hacking the state against itself, but how many in here, how many have heard of any other Swedish political party? Any of them? One, two, three, yeah. <laughs> so. Thank you. So, so funny, this is, this is true no matter where on the globe I'm presenting, and I, I think that's kind of funny. So I founded the first Pirate Party on January 1st, 2006. It just took off like a rocket, and it spread to 60 countries after my proof of concept of putting two people in the European Parliament, kicking the old dinosaurs out of office, which is the one effective way to change policy. Because a career politician has, it, has priorities on their list. The first priority is to get elected. The second priority is to get re-elected. And whatever is third is so far behind, it never matters. Which means that if you want to change policy, you've got to take aim at any of those two first. We did. It worked. So we did that through voluntarism, swarm leadership, what I call swarm leadership. I spoke about that last year here at, here at Anarchapoco and how we had a cost efficiency advantage of two orders of magnitude over the old dinosaurs. We were running circles around them. And I wrote a book about that. It was in the intro here. You can get it for free at falkvinge.net slash books. But if you just remember the name Swarmwise, you can find it easily. Uh, this, uh, I got some awards for that. Foreign Policy Magazine named me a top 100 global thinker. Time Magazine shortlisted me as one of the 100 most influential people across all categories, guardian of all newspapers called me top 20 freedom fighter, and so on and so forth. That's kind of fun, but at the end of the day, these are magazines trying to sell, sell copies. So what matters are, are the IDs solid? And we're going to look at some of these IDs today in the, his, in the light of history. And I think you're going to find it quite funny. Uh, what I'm doing today is also that I'm head of privacy, head of liberty, if you like, at a VPN company called Private Internet Access. My favorite kind of act activism is the financially sustainable one. So we keep giving people liberty, or selling liberty, if you like, at a very affordable price. I'm writing a software package called SwarmOps, which is essentially a back end to the methods described in SwarmWise. It's got public domain, of course, going into beta in just a few months. You can look it up on GitHub. And I'm doing speaking like this. So, today's entertainment, media militarization through 600 years. There are some very 
common red threads throughout history. And I'm going to illustrate with a few examples of how the dinosaurs react when they're threatened, as they are right here, right now. Militarization, of course. That doesn't mean rolling in tanks. For us, that can mean something else. It means the state using arms against peaceful civilians, which is bad. We all agree that's bad. So I lost my slides again. I'm going to roll on whenever you guys get the slides up. I'm good. Did we already get them? No, my screen went blank here. So going back to, th to the, uh, ah, here we are. So a couple of red lines is that everybody used media to wage war on knowledge. They used media to wage war on knowledge. Everybody had their own flavor of fake news. And it was about the power of the narrative. I'll be coming back to that again and again and again. The power of the narrative. And how history repeats itself. So, in the 1500s, this was right after the Black Death in Europe. The monasteries were decimated because the population was decimated. And the last institution to become repopulated was the monasteries because people could just not afford to send kids off who were needed at the farm. This meant that the cost of books were astronomical, and the people who had the power of narrative in this time were the Catholic Church, because these were the guys who were not only controlling all media production in the monasteries. No book got copied by hand, laboriously, by a monk and nun, unless the Catholic Church agreed that it should be copied. But they also controlled all media reading, because these books were in Latin. Nobody could read Latin except the clergy and some nobility who didn't care what books said. And even if people could read Latin, which was unheard of, a book cost in today's value in, on the order of half a million to one full million dollars completely out of reach for the common people. So they held the power of narrative. I'm, somet I'm sometimes doing a little thought experiment, you know, as in if you were to write all the world's news for a week, what would you write about? How would you exploit that position? Some people think in terms of well, I, can write on, I could write about myself, make myself famous. Some go a step beyond saying, I could write that I am famous, making people believe it already. I could write that I'm rich. Th these are missing the point. If you can determine true from false, if you can dictate true from false, you don't need money in your life ever again. You can make people believe it's in their self-interest to serve you. You can make people believe it's in their self-interest to serve you. And this is what has happened again and again and again through history. Those who wield power have used that power to tell people it's in their interest that the people in power keep the power again and again and again. And the Catholic Church made sure that if, on the odd chance, there were some who disagreed, they would send out paramilitary inquisitions and crush their balls, or worse, usually worse. Then came this invention, Gutenberg, 1453. It was a combination of four different inventions. We think of it as one invention, but it was a combination of four, and that's important, because those four inventions were the movable type we think of, but movable type had existed before. This was metal movable type, which made it accurate. It was the squeeze press, which made it cheap to, to print a lot. It was oil-based ink, which made the books permanent. And perhaps most importantly, something you never hear in the history lessons, it was cheap paper. It was paper made from old discarded clothing. That made a book insanely cheap compared 
to when you needed 300 sheepskins just to get the pages, the blank pages. This allowed information to be distributed cheaply, quickly, and accurately. What happens when an invention comes on the world stage that dramatically allows people to distribute information cheaply, quickly, and accurately? Well, we're, we're living in one of those times. Publish without permission of the Catholic Church. People were starting to spread ideas that were not sanctioned by the previous holder of the power of narrative. In particular, this guy came on stage. He, he was a little later. Gutenberg came, his, came with the print, his printing press in 1453. He thought it would increase the power of the Catholic Church because Bibles would be more accurate. There would be no more errors in copying. Instead, this guy came on stage. Oh, that's me. No, it's not. <laughs> Martin Luther. Not Martin Luther King. That guy came much later. This is Martin Luther. And he had had his 95 Thesis, which he nailed to the church wall in, I believe, Padua in 1517, where he was protesting how the church was abusing its power of narrative. Specifically, he protested that it was selling salvation to raise funds. Since the Catholic Church could absolve people of their sins and promise them to get into heaven, the Catholic Church had this brilliant idea that, hey, why don't we charge for this to raise money? And somewhere Martin Luther found that the idea that rich people could get into heaven as much as they wanted, whereas poor people needed to work for it, he found that didn't quite have support in the Christian message. So he was protesting this corruption of the message within the Catholic Church. That's what we learn in history class. I'm going to take it a significant level deeper. Because what Martin Luther did next was to publish Bibles in German and French seven years later, in 1524, the so-called Luther Bibles, which immediately led to a century of civil war across the entire continent. And this is how we back up a little bit and wait. How did a Bible in German lead to a century of civil war again? But remember now, the Bible had always been in Latin. The Bible had always been in Latin. That meant that everybody had had to trust the clergy about what the Bible said. Suddenly, people could go to the source and verify the claims people were able to go to the source and verify the claims. The power of narrative had been broken. The dinosaur media no longer controlled what was true and false. The power of interpretation, the power of seeing reality, no longer laid with the Catholic Church alone. Even if it still lay with the Bible, the Catholic Church could not unchallenged claim what was in it. The power of dictating truth was broken. So the Catholic Church had lost a gatekeeper position over knowledge and culture, which led to a 180 degree shift of power in Europe, releasing tensions that led to the so-called religious wars roughly 1530 to, four, to 1530 to 1630, a full century of war among the entire known world at the time, because a book was printed in a language that people could read, because the power holder at the time lost the gatekeeper position of knowledge and culture. Now, The, obviously, they tried to prevent this from happening. So the state militarized against this challenge to his narrative. The, the clergy went to the royalties and said that, you must do something. We are get, these people are spreading fake news left and right. <laughs> and 
And so punishments, not for spreading fake news, but for using a printing press, gradually increased throughout Europe, throughout the known world, until on January 13, 1535, in France, the penalty for unauthorized copying hit the death penalty by hanging. That's the, the penalty for using a printing press for any purpose. As in, would you, are you really daring to not use these old fine copying services of the Catholic Church? They charge only a million dollars per book. Are you greedy? Are you lazy? Do you want to do this yourself? Stand in fucking line, citizen. And here's the interesting thing. Not even the death penalty worked to deter unauthorized copying. The genie was out of the bottle, and people had tasted what it was like to verify claims from the source, to not have to trust somebody in blanco. Now, so, you have had a dinosaur gatekeeper over knowledge and culture. You had a dinosaur gatekeeper over knowledge and culture. Along comes a new technology that allows the entire population to just circumvent them, and not just circumvent them, maybe even ignore them, ignore what they're saying. They react to this phenomenon by wanting to punish those who use the new technology, punish the new medium, punish the carriers of the new medium. They, they scream for laws against this new medium, against this new technology. This was in, in the 1550s. Does any of this sound the slightest familiar? England didn't try to ban printing. Instead, Queen Mary I at the time went another route and created a monopoly on printing. On May 4th, 1557, she gave a monopoly, a commercial monopoly on printing to a guild called the London Company of Stationers in exchange for being able to censor anything printed. In this way, she got a very effective tool for repressing political dissidents. This distribution monopoly, production and distribution monopoly, was called copyright, and it's unfortunately still around. The copyright industry really will not tell you this part of their, of their history. So there is a quote from Commissioner Lal that I really like and which applies to everything throughout history. Beware of he who would deny you access to information, for in his heart he dreams himself your master. Everything is about knowledge. Everything is about narrative. If you can circumvent the dinosaurs, you're dangerous to them, and they will treat you accordingly. As we know, the Protestants won a significant part of these, the, these religious wars. About half of Europe became, got loose from the Catholic Church. And we can learn from things from that, from something from that. Because the reason they won was because they had a superior use of the printing press. They were experts in using the new technology, whereas the Catholic Church insisted on doing the way it had always been done because that is the way it had always been done. So what the Protestants did was to create discussions. They printed ideas. They printed dialogues. They distributed these dialogues and held reading sessions where you would read people's, people's discussions and ask them to submit ideas and comments back to the people holding the discussions. They were doing blogs and forums in the 1550s. And that's how they won against the mighty Catholic Church. This gives us a blueprint. Not just this, but all other points in history I'll, 
I'll touch on here gives us a blueprint on how to deal with today's dinosaurs. It gives us an insight into what their Achilles heels are, because they are human and they behave like humans. Even if the technology is different from 600 years ago, the behavioral patterns, the yearning for power, the yearning to suppress dissent, you'll find it's identical. So, a lot of power was wrestled wrestle out from the churches and instead we get corporations. Much better in terms of keeping the narrative straight, keeping people honest and all, of, all around just making sure we have a shiny, shiny new narrative. It turns out that corporations quickly became new gatekeepers, new gatekeepers of knowledge and culture. And they learned that they could use this new narrative to control the truth and control your adversaries. In particular, they could use it to prevent innovation and thereby prevent their replacements. If you can control what, law, what lawmakers think is true, what we call lobbyism today, then you can essentially outlaw your replacement. And I'm going to give you one specific example, which I think is, again, a very illustrative example. And it's a red flag. It's a red flag. Because when the automobile was invented, it wasn't called that back then, but when the automobile was invented, a lot of people panicked. This was a noisy thing that caused a lot of people to be scared because they hadn't seen anything similar before, and what about this, and what about that, and so on. So there was something called a Red Flag Act of 1865. A Red Flag Act, or the Red Flag Act of 1865 in the United Kingdom. It mandated that every automobile must have a crew of three people a crew of three people. The driver, the guy holding the wheel, a stoker, essentially a machinist if something should break, and most interestingly, interestingly a guy walking in front of the car waving a red flag. <laughs> Here's an image from, from that time. It's from 1850-something, so I think it just came out of copyright. And what's interesting about this is that limiting cars to two miles per hour, which was the effect, I mean, it was limited to walking speed, since somebody had to literally walk in front of it. Limiting the cars to two miles per hour, that limited the automobile's utility to safely and slowly transporting people and cargo to the previous transportation hubs which were railroad and stagecoach stage stations. It, it became clear much, much later how this law had came about, who had lobbied for it, and, and which interests had made sure that this would happen. Do you have any idea which industries made this law happen? Of course it was. What we see here is that the dinosaurs tend to pretend to embrace new technology. They say that, yeah, this is a great technology. We just need to regulate it a tiny little weensy bit. And that tiny little weensy regulation is actually choking it, preventing its utility, and specifically preventing the replacement of the old dinosaurs. And once this kind of mass hysteria has kicked in that, yes, regulate the best thing in the world, let's regulate more. You can see, I mean, I worked in the European Parliament, it's... There, 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 there were literally times when you would just see your eyes glaze over at something and like, one of my, one of my co-workers would go, vodka, 
I need vodka. <laughs> One of my favorite examples of how this mass hysteria can kick in is from Pennsylvania. Because this red flag act, you, you, should, you don't think it stayed in the UK, do you? No, this was a great idea. This went on export big time. So in Pennsylvania, this red flag act wasn't just about waving a red flag, no. Because car scared horses and livestock. So the law in Pennsylvania, or I should say the bill in Pennsylvania, said that the operator of an automobile, I think we'd call it a driver today, when seeing livestock or horses up the street, must immediately take three specific actions. They must stop the vehicle immediately. They must disassemble the vehicle immediately. <laughs> and, they and they must hide all the parts in nearby vegetation. This bill passed unanimously. Unanimously. I believe the year was 1865. No, that was red flag, so this is slightly later. You can look it up. It's mind-blowing. It didn't become law because the governor refused to sign it. That's the only thing that reason this did not become law. So, can't we have then just a little bit of sympathy with these dinosaurs? Like, don't they have a right to make money like they always did? Isn't there a right to be rich? Isn't there a right to be just seek rent from the world here? You know, I sometimes take the example of a company called Stockholm Ice. Stockholm, the city I live in, a few more days. And bef this was before households were electrified. Stockholm Ice had as their business to go out to bar, to go out to lakes in wintertime, saw up big blocks of ice and store these huge blocks of ice on sawdust in barns and then carry these heavy blocks of ice out to households th so they could keep perishables for longer. Because this was before the electric refrigerator. In the early 1920s, the cities of Europe and the United States got electricity to households. It was a process that didn't take more than five years. The biggest employer in the city went belly up. Biggest employer. Many, many personal tragedies for people who would never again make a living carrying huge blocks of ice. And yet, Nobody suggested a $3,000 refrigerator fee to go to the Ice Makers Union as compensation for technology. This is blunt, but people do not deserve to be compensated for the passage of time. It doesn't work like that. So technology has always changed business models, and it always will. One of my favorites, as you know, since I'm the founder of the Pirate Party, is the copyright industry, which I've studied in depth. <sighs> wow. 1849, let's start with 1849 of the copyright industry. That year, lawmakers in the United Kingdom suggested that we should open public libraries. Before then, there had only been private libraries. So you needed, essentially, somebody's permission to go and read books if you couldn't afford them yourself. Parliament thought it was a splendid idea that anybody could access knowledge and culture without having access to a rich guy. So they, they passed a law saying or enabling the opening of public libraries. And the copyright industry went absolutely ballistic. They said, you can't be serious. You can't seriously allow anybody to read any book without paying for it. If you allow this law to pass, no author will be able to make, make a living writing books ever again. Not a single book will be written after this law. Mark my words. And as we all know, there were indeed no books written after 1849 ever again. 
the, the copyright industry has been calling the, doing this, the sky's, the sky's falling dance, roughly every, every five years. The, in 1905, they claimed that the self-playing piano and the gramophone would be, quote, the end of a vivid, songful humanity, end quote. 1929, they claimed that the fall of record revenue from, 20, from $75, 75 million dollars to a mere five million dollars was entirely the fault of broadcast radio and had nothing to do with the great recession, great recession that happened, great depression even that happened then. Loudspeakers made orchestras in theaters obsolete. Television, television. They were absolutely furious because they were running cinemas. And if people could watch movies for free, how could they possibly compete having to, ha having to have paid service? Ten years later, they were absolutely furious at cable television because television had to have a free service. And how could they possibly compete with paid? Which is the exact opposite argument. Photocopier would again make sure that no books were ever written again. Loudspeakers. DJs took or live, live music out of action, and the cassette tape, which was a... I think they still, they still get private, private rent money from a lot of places for the existence of the cassette tape. Here's page two. It goes on. So a question here. What are the, who are the rail, stagecoast and railroad industries today trying to prevent the internet, but who are actually choking it? Preventing its utility because it, it knows they know that it'll kill their business. Do we have an idea? Bad music. music. Who more? Politicians. Politicians. Yes. Although it's the next answer. Ma there are many good answers here. The ones, the the uh, my suggestions were tel were telecom and cable TV first, because when I have 100 megabit general purpose in a jack, in the wall, there is no way I'm going to pay per minute for lousy voice service. Cable TV, who even watches things on a schedule anymore? And as came up here, now also news media. Also news media, and by extension, politicians. So a quick look at the last century, preventing fake media in the 1900s. Because by now, there was something called freedom of the press. By now, there was something called constitutions and bill of rights. And so politicians couldn't do this just cracking down with a paramil paramilitary Spanish inquisition anymore. When the labor movement got established in Scandinavia, they, the establishment at the time couldn't prohibit them from printing anything they liked. But you know, they still needed somebody to print it, and nobody would print it for them. Nobody would print it for them. By a sheer random, they couldn't get a contract anywhere in the entire country. So what the Swedish labor activists did was to take a rowboat to neighboring Denmark to print it there. And they carried the newspapers on the rowboats back to the home country. Fast forward another 50 years, and this practice of out of colluding to prevent printing was outlawed, but you had really embarrassing communists, at least according to the government, in World War II who wanted to print their pamphlets. And so you couldn't outlaw printing, you couldn't, outlaw, you couldn't prevent them from printing it, so what, you, what did the government do? They banned transporting it, of course. They banned taking newspapers on trains. This is, this is real, this, this really happened. They banned taking newspapers, these specific newspapers, on any kind of public transport. And what we learned from this is that through the past 600 years, the governmental attacks have been on the enabling technology as opposed to the ideas themselves. As opposed to the ideas themselves. The government never responded to the ideas, just tried to prevent their distribution, tried to prevent people from hearing them because they were dangerous. That law that criminalized use of a printing press in France on January 15, 30, 15, 30, January 13, 1535, 
When you go out to the legislative logs and look at the justification for this particular law, you'll see a strong echo of history because the reason for it was to prevent the spread of fake news and false information. All of these attacks through the past, past 600 years were repulsed in the same way by decentralized voluntarism. Many people working together in a decentralized, unattackable fashion to circumvent the central choke points. Every single attack that was successfully repulsed was repulsed like this. This is how we should regard fake news and today's dinosaurs. So this gives us a blueprint. This gives us a blueprint. People won 500 years ago, 300 years ago, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, and 50 years ago in roughly the same way. It was the same struggle, it was the same power conflict, only the technology differed. The state had militarized, it was a war on knowledge, and therefore it was won by spreading that knowledge which the government fought. Once that knowledge is learned, it cannot be unlearned. When people had read the Bible in German, they could not go back to only hearing somebody talk about it. When people had learned to check the sources, they could not unlearn what a power that was, and they would not go back to being sheep ever again. We hold the information advantage today. We hold that. And we don't just hold the information advantage, we hold the infrastructure advantage. We know how to set up servers. Do you think the government does? Do you think any member of parliament knows how to set up a mail server? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So three things. We teach the world how to share, seek, and publish without permission. We document the violence waged on those who would merely seek to share knowledge or connect, or connect people. And when others learn of these transgressions, it becomes obvious that the dinosaurs have something to hide or something to protect. And we stand by one another when this happens. This is not against when one of us go to jail, all of us go to jail. That is absolutely crucial to realize. When one of us is threatened, all of us are threatened. And we need to act accordingly. When people have done that in the past, they always, always, without exception, won. So as a final observation, authority used to be sold. And the reason authority could be sold is that because it was controlled. Authority was controlled. The reason it could be controlled in the first place was because it was scarce. Media was scarce. The word was scarce. Communication was scarce. And therefore, authority was scarce. Today, however, authority is abundant. Any one of us can stand up say what we want, and people can choose to follow. Authority has become abundant. It is no longer scarce, and therefore it is no longer controlled and can no longer be sold. Authority is abundant today. Change doesn't just happen. Somebody makes change happen. So as one final thought from this, do you want to be that person? Do you want to be the person that makes change happen? Thank you. In a world where Antifa riots in the city streets, cops rage out of control, and the leader of the free world is a fat-ass casino owner, one event stands alone to make anarchy great again. I actually love humanity.
That is why I'm an anarchist. Backwards in the building like we the ceiling. We healing no matter who find it appealing. I'm here and I got a feeling that we be dealing a lot of pain with a pin of ceiling. Get drilled in your head that we are monsters and yeah we come from the slums and for months we've been pumped but for once I am now comfortable. I want to grow. I want some more success and I want to know that greatness can't be rushed. Can't be less so face the bus. Feel free to hate on us. We lace them up. Dudes we don't pay them up. Keep snakes away from us and safe from us. You might want to be. Remember when clowns used to make fun of me and now they want to be me. See me and they run at me. I'm going to be the greatest. Yeah I want to be but I am not the one to be the biggest for the sake of being played i'm here like i never left set to hell nah cause i can't just fail so just prepare your ears it'll get for real okay, from here, we will never take the sale it's my time my mind and my thoughts my eyes and my thoughts my ways and my loss when will i fall off it's a chance for me you are now listening to veracity yeah fuck the media fuck the banks fuck drone strikes fuck tanks fuck hunger fuck war fuck ignoring of the poor fuck the left fuck the right fuck the government thank you thank you thank you thank you